morning, church. May God bless you and keep you as we open the word of the Lord this morning and look into it. And may he give us wisdom and discernment as we discern his will that we might glorify him in our very lives. I invite you to open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 will be our text this morning. If you're using the Bible located underneath the seat in front of you, I believe it's on page 802. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The Word of God reads, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widower and the fatherless, against those who trust who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. God of justice, we thank you that you are both the purifier of your people and the judge of your enemies. We thank you that in your sovereign wisdom, you uphold your justice and your mercy in one fell swoop. Your wisdom is beyond our comprehension, God. We thank you that you are who you are. You are the great I am. And we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. So, Lord, we ask that we would humble ourselves before the authority of your word. That we would be a people who live on not bread alone, but on every word that is from the Lord. That you would sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Lord, that we would have the utmost confidence knowing that every bit of scripture is breathed out by you. So Lord, would you use your word as only you can by your spirit and do a work in us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we left off with the question, where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? And if you'll remember, Israel was focused on her circumstances, and she was disheartened by the fact that the kingdom promises had not yet actualized, that Persia was still in rule, and they wanted the the kingdom to be restored to Israel. But as they looked around, 70 years after the temple had been rebuilt, the kingdom had not yet been restored to Israel. Therefore, instead of trusting the promises of God, Israel began to question the character of God. And she cried out, where is the God of justice. And ultimately, this question is answered in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either the just wrath of God that is due to you because you have rebelled and sinned against the holy God was poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ, or you are in wait for that wrath of God to be poured out upon you. Make no mistake about it. It's one or the other. Either Christ lived in your stead a perfect, spotless life, 
that it would be imputed to your account that as God would look upon you if you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he would see your sin no more, but you would be forgiven and washed clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. And when he comes again, his wrath will be poured out on those who are not in Christ. In the context of Malachi, the, the answer to the question of 2.17, where is the God of justice, is answered in our text this morning. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But before we dive into our text, we must take note that Malachi's original audience had no understanding of a dual or of a twofold coming of Christ. That is not what they were expecting at all. See, you and I, brother, sister, and friend, are blessed enough to live on this side of the cross where we know that Messiah has come and that he will come again. But for Malachi's audience, they are expecting Messiah or they are expecting the Christ to come and to restore the kingdom to Israel and to fulfill the kingdom promises. Well, as you may well notice, the Messiah has come. And the kingdom has not yet been restored to Israel. As a matter of fact, Jews today are still awaiting for the restoration of Israel. This is the number one reason why they have rejected their Messiah, because their expectations were not met. And so Israel, as a nation, has rejected the Christ. So what we have in the Old Testament is frequently and often we have passages that talk about the coming of Christ and they intermingle the first coming, and the second coming of Christ. I believe that is the case in our text today. What a glorious truth it is that Christ has come. What a glorious truth it is that Christ will come again. But notice that the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ are distinct both in function and in nature. He came to seek and save the lost. He came gentle, meek, and mild. But when he comes again, he will come as the conquering king. He will come as judge over all the earth. So where is the God of justice? Let us look to see how the Lord answers this question in the book of Malachi. In our text, Malachi 3, verses 1 through 5, there are three promises that the Lord will accomplish in order to display his justice. Three promises that the Lord will accomplish in order to display his justice. The first promise is in verse 1, and he says he will come. The second promise is in verses 2 through 4, he will purify his people. And the third promise is in verse 5, he will judge his enemies. So let us begin with the first promise. Look with me in verse 1. He will come. Verse 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Let's stop right there for a moment. Who is speaking here? If you look at the end of verse 1, says the Lord of hosts, and note there that the Lord is in all caps. What does that mean? As you know, that means Yahweh, the personal name of God, the covenant name of God, the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, of angel armies is speaking. And he says, behold, I send my messenger. Behold, look, see, pay attention. I send my messenger. In the Hebrew, it, can, it conveys a, a sense of certainty and imminence. I'm about to send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. What we have here is a picture of ancient Near Eastern kings, and what they would do before they would arrive in a certain city is they would send servants before them to clear their path, to set aside obstacles that the king would have a straight shot to his destination. And that's exactly the picture that we have here. He will send a messenger to prepare the way before him. Remember in chapter 1, uh, verse 14, what does the Lord say of himself? He says, for I am a great king. Says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared 
among the nations. He is sending someone before him, a messenger, to prepare his way. Who is the messenger? That's the question. Who is this messenger? Well, if you look in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, what we have in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 4 of the book of Malachi is kind of the epilogue to the book. It sums up the whole book, if you will. Verse 4 sums up the first half. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. And then in verses 5 and 6, it sums up the second half of the book. And this is what he says, and listen to the language. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So the messenger in chapter 3, verse 1 is the messenger in chapter 4 that is identified as Elijah. The New Testament identifies this messenger or this Elijah figure as John the Baptist. All four Gospels, if you remember, if you've been been in the Gospels recently, all four Gospels point to John the Baptist as this messenger. The Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, actually quote Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, pointing or in reference to John the Baptist. Matthew 11.10, Mark 1.2, Luke 7.27. All of them say, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Now at this point, brothers and sisters and friends, I must confess that good and godly men disagree over the interpretation of this text. I must also confess that some of those good and godly men are your elders. So what I'm going to attempt to do is to give us a, 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 an understanding of, of the two major views and show you which view I believe and why I believe it. Remember earlier that I said it is vitally important for us to understand that Malachi's audience has no concept of the twofold coming of Christ. But we do. So the question is this. Is there an Elijah figure that precedes Christ in both his first and his second coming? That's the question. Is there an Elijah figure that precedes Christ in both his first and his second coming? And some would say, no, absolutely not. Some look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and understand it to be fulfilled, or at least mostly fulfilled, in the first coming of Christ, they would say that John the Baptist is Elijah, the only Elijah that is to come, another one is not coming, and that Christ entered his temple during his first coming, and that the Levites mentioned in this passage are either a picture of the church, the priesthood of believers who will worship him in spirit and in truth, or a future generation of Jews who may be saved, but it's not a literal, a literal uh, restoration of the Levitical priesthood. And so in verse 4, where it says, then the offering of Judah in Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years, some would take that to be every true believer in Christ, which is now the church. Others would say, yes, there is an Elijah figure that precedes both the first and the second coming of Christ. And this is the camp that I would fall into. We would understand this passage to be mostly fulfilled near or during the second coming of Christ. We would agree that the coming Elijah was typologically or analogously fulfilled in John the Baptist. But that another Elijah, quite possibly the Elijah of old, will precede the second coming of Christ. And now you're thinking to yourself, but wait a minute, Kenny, you just told me with your own words that all four Gospels identify John the Baptist as this Elijah figure. And I did. But that is not all that they say. Let's do a little work in the Gospels. Remember, turn with me to John 1. Remember in John chapter 1, priests and Levites, which is interesting, are sent from Jerusalem to investigate John the Baptist. 
And John the Baptist plainly says, I am not the Christ. John 1.20, he confessed, John the Baptist confessed, and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And then they, the priests and the Levites from Jerusalem, asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. And so John the Baptist says he's not Elijah. Jesus says, this is Elijah who is to come. What do we have going on here? Well, turn with me to Matthew 11. To set the stage for the text I'm going to read, Matthew 11, John the Baptist is now in prison, and he seems to be somewhat confused. So he sends his disciples to Jesus to ask, hey, are are you the one that we... We're expecting, or should we wait for another? And Jesus quotes out of Isaiah the fulfillment of some, not all, but some of the messianic prophecies. And listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. And if you are willing to accept it, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. Interesting. What is John the Baptist come preaching? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? And he says that I baptize you with water for repentance, but, the, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's John the Baptist's message. Well, once he goes into, into prison, where's this unquenchable fire? Where's this winnowing fork? And so he's questioning these things. And John says, if you are will, or Jesus says in, in, John, in Matthew eleven fourteen, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. So there seems to be a contingency. He's speaking to the crowd there. Picturesque of Israel. Israel, if you are willing to accept it, then John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. The question then is, did they accept it? Well, let's continue in Matthew 11. Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And then Jesus goes on to lash out, to speak against the unrepentant cities in Israel. And so it seems as if they didn't accept John the Baptist as the Elijah who is to come. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, the transfiguration takes place, and we remember that Peter, James, and John are with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration when his glory is shown as he is transfigured. And who else appears on that mountain? None other than Moses and Elijah. And on the way down from this mountain, look in Matthew 17, verse 9. It says, And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And so there's this Hebrew understanding, this Jewish understanding, that before the Lord comes and restores all things, that Elijah will come first. And so they're like, wait a minute. This just happened. We saw you in your glory. There's Moses and Elijah. Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Now listen to Jesus' reply. He answered, Jesus answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. The NASB says, Elijah is coming, and when he does come, he will restore all things. And so Jesus, after the coming of John the Baptist, looks and says, Elijah's coming. In a future tense, he will restore all things. Look again in Matthew 17, 12. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him but did to him whatever they pleased. 
so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And so it appears in that, this text that Jesus says, Elijah is coming and will come and he'll restore all things, but Elijah has come as well. So it appears that Elijah both has come in the person of John the Baptist before the first coming of Jesus Christ, but there's another Elijah who might take to be the prophet of old who will come again before the second coming of Christ to restore all things. Some people identify this Elijah with one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. I don't want us to miss the point here, though. We can get tied down to those details, and there may be different viewpoints. The biggest thing is this, is that Israel says, where is the God of justice? And the response is that he is coming. And before he comes to execute justice, he will send a messenger before him. The Elijah figure is the first messenger in Malachi 3.1 who comes to prepare the way of the Lord. Then after that, the Lord himself will come. Look with me back in Malachi chapter 3, continuing on in verse 1. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Again, the Lord Yahweh is speaking here. And what he's doing is he is declaring that a second person, that a divine person, will come after the first messenger, and it is stated in such a way that conveys the reality of the Trinity even in the Old Testament. Let's take note of what happens. It's the Lord speaking, and he says that someone's going to prepare a way for him. But notice in the second part of verse 2, you see the term and the Lord there. It's not all caps in your Bibles, is it? It's a different term in the Hebrew. The term is speaking of a master or a king. The Lord will come as a king whom you seek, and he will suddenly come where? To his temple. Well, who owns the temple? God himself, does he not? So we see very clearly a strong statement about the deity of the Messiah. So many people say, well, you know, Messiah will come, but he certainly won't be God. He certainly won't be divine. Well, everything, grammatically speaking, in chapter 3, verse 1, says the Messiah will certainly be divine. And as a matter of fact, he has come and will come again. There's such irony here. It says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, and I take that to be a reiteration of the Lord who they seek, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Well, at this point, is Israel truly seeking the Lord? At this point, is Israel truly delighting in the Lord? No. Why do they want the Lord to come? Certainly not for spiritual well-being, but that the kingdom would be restored and they would live lavishly in the kingdom that they are awaiting, not to have a right relationship with God. And we see the irony there. He is coming. But he's going to come in a way that you don't expect. That's the irony here. And notice that he says, will come suddenly. Will suddenly come. This word does not mean immediately. So often we can read a text like this and say, well, 2,000 years later, we are still waiting for him to come suddenly. That doesn't seem very sudden to me. No, the idea is that he will come instantaneously and unannounced, like a thief in the night. I want to make this crystal clear to any of you who are not in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will come. 
Sometimes we can get bogged down in our sin and I'll wait until tomorrow to repent and turn from my sin. I'll wait until a year from now. I'm still young. Can I just live my life? Can I just have a little bit of fun before I submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Foolish, foolish, foolish thinking. Today, today is the day of salvation. For the Lord will come when it is least expected for those who are in their sin. And what will you do then? I encourage you with every fiber of my being, I call you today on this very day, in this very moment, turn from your sin, repent of your sin, and put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that when he comes, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, rather than depart from me. I never knew you. Hear this. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come, and he will come again suddenly. Why does he come? Why does he come? And this brings us to the second promise. One of the reasons why he comes is to purify his people. Is to purify his people. We see this in verse 2. Look with me in verse 2 of Malachi 3. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. The implied answer is that no one can stand, that no one can hold up. The picture is one withstanding the force of a great army, and this is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies speaking, and there is not one of us in our own right that can stand when he appears again. This is so beautifully seen in the book of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation 6. I want you to see this. Revelation chapter 6. The Lord Jesus Christ is opening up the seals. The wrath of God is being poured out in the tribulation period. And look what Revelation 6, 15 says. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come. And who can stand? Well, there's not one of us. Who can stand if we are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? The very next chapter, though, note what happens in the book of Revelation. By his great, 144,000 Jews are sealed. We can only stand the coming wrath of the Lord if we are in Christ. If his grace is extended to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Back to Malachi chapter 3. None of us can stand, for he is like a refiner's fire, says verse 2, and like fuller's soap. What we have here are two pictures of intense purifying agents. Intense purifying agents. The first is this, a refiner's fire. It was a high heat fire that burned off dross in order to purify the metal. The second is fuller's soap or launderer's soap. And what this was was concentrated alkaline that was extracted from ice plants and used as detergents to take away stains from clothing. The Lord will purify his people in this manner, intensely, with much pain and much affliction, but for the purpose of their purification rather than their destruction. Continuing in verse 3, we get more detail. He will sit as a refiner and purify, and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. We have the sovereign Lord. And notice what he's doing in verse 3. He's sitting. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. Sovereign Lord sitting, 
completely and totally in control. And this is a picture of a silversmith using considerable care as he watches over the metal in which he purifies. Silversmith in this day would have to sit looking into the metal furnace, watching as it heated up and as the color of the metal started to glow. And there was a particular color that the silversmith would look for to know that the metal had been purified. This was technical. This was intricate. This took great detail. And this is how the Lord is depicted here. When that process is complete, when that process is complete, then and only then will the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing to the Lord. Continuing in verse 3, note it says, He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. As I have mentioned earlier, some take this prophecy to be fulfilled in the church. And the sons of Levi here, for those with this view, would say, this is the priesthood of all believers that are now in the church. Some would say, well, maybe this is a future salvation of Jews, but not necessarily the restoration of the Levitical priesthood. The offering in Judah and Jerusalem would be a picture of true worship, which is now done in the church, they would say. But others would say that this actually is the restored Levitical priesthood and Israel, the nation, who bring offerings to the Lord at the temple in the millennial kingdom. And this is the view that I take. Now, I, we need to make some distinctions because what so often happens is people think in this way and they think that there's a, a bicovenantalism, that, that Christians are saved one way and that Israel is saved another way. Make it crystal clear that this is all done through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 tells us, that the blood of bulls never atoned for sin anyway. We are saved by grace through faith. So what then is this sacrificial system if it is to be restored in the millennial kingdom? I believe this is a commemoration of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Much like Christians today come to the Lord's table and remember his body and his blood, his death, that is efficacious for those of us who believe then once Levi's sons have been purified, they will commemorate the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial temple. And those who understand this text like that, look at Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 as that millennial kingdom. And what's interesting, if we had time we could go there, but in Ezekiel 43, the glory of the Lord reappears in the temple. Guess what didn't happen in Malachi's day? The glory of the Lord didn't appear in the temple. So as I said before, good and godly men disagree over these things. I want us to get the big picture. That God is faithful to always purify those whom he has chosen. That God is faithful to always purify those who whom he has chosen, regardless of your view on Israel. That includes you and I. That God will purify you completely and totally and fully. And this is the doctrine of glorification when we are glorified and made to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. He will come. As a matter of fact, he has come. And he will come again. And he will purify all whom he has elected to be in his kingdom. This brings us to our third and final promise. The question is this, if you are not going to be found in that kingdom, then what? What if you're not redeemed? What if you have not trusted in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What if you continue in your rebellion? What if he comes back when you are unrepentant and in your sin? And look with me at promise number three in verse five. He will judge his enemies. He will judge his enemies. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, 
against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. This is the definitive answer to the question in Malachi 2.17. Where is the God of justice? He will purify those who are his and he will judge those who are not his. One commentator said that God's justice necessarily emerges in judgment. If God is who he says he is, he must judge not some sin, not most sin, not the majority, 99% of sin, but all sin. God's justice necessarily emerges in judgment. This is the answer that Israel wanted to see and hear immediately. That God would come, and that he would execute judgment on their enemies. But the Lord must first purify those whom he has chosen before he executes judgment upon those whom have remained in their rebellion. Let us look and see what it says. Notice the shift. In verse 3, it says, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Now in verse 5, it says, I, I will draw near to you for judgment. So as if Yahweh himself is speaking. There's a closeness, an imminency of this judgment that is certain to happen. And he speaks through the prophet uh, Malachi and says, I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against what we see here is Yahweh as judge, Yahweh as prosecutor, and Yahweh as witness. He is the only one who has the right to fill all of those seats. He judges over all the earth. He prosecutes those who have sinned against him, and he is a witness as he sees the entirety of the world. Judge, prosecutor, and witness. And then we have this list of injustice that is going on in Israel during their time and in their day. And just remember this, 2.17, what did the people say? Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. That's the charge that Israel has against Yahweh, and that's not true at all. Note how many times in verse 5 it says that Yahweh is against, 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 against all the injustices that are going on in the lives of his nation. He's against injustice, both back then and now. He's a God who desires righteousness and justice to reign. I will be a swift witness against first the sorcerers. This list is, all these things are clearly spoken against in the law of Moses. Every single one of these things on, these, on this list. The sorcerers, this is black magic, and this was going on in Israel after their captivity of Babylon. Well, why is it going on? Chapter 2, verse 11. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. These foreign gods, these pagan people would often try to conjure up this demonic magic to, to seek God and to, to do things that are against his will, and it seeps into Israel. He has judgment against the sorcerer. Also judgment against adulterers. Well, where do we see that? We've already seen that in the book of Malachi, have we not? Malachi 2.14, but you say, why does he not? Why does he not accept their offering? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your, your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. What's happening is people are divorcing their wives and getting other wives, and this is adultery in the sight of the Lord. He's against adulterers. Carries on. And the fact that he's against those who swear falsely. And, and this is actually connected to the marriage vows, right? They vow to be faithful to this wife, 
That's a false vow. Detestable in the sight of the Lord. Goes on. He's against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages. You know what was really easy to do? Especially for the fatherless, especially for the orphan, especially for the widow, is to say, hey, if you do this work for me, I'll pay you this much. But guess what? There's no head of the household to make sure that that payment is met. So it's easy to tell a child who's fatherless, hey, I'll pay you this much, do this work, give them very little or not anything in return. And that's exactly what's going on. The Lord is against this. Those who oppress the widow, those who oppress the faithless, those who are vulnerable, and those who has, God has a special concern for. And lastly, he says, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me. Sojourner, people that are unlike the people of Israel, right? Israel, covenant with God, people come into their nation. What's the easy thing to do? To have disdain upon them, to look down upon those who are dislike us, to treat them harshly. Note that every one of these sins, you and I in the church area era can still fall victim to. The Lord has not changed his desire for his people. He detests these things. Lying, adultery, oppressing the hired hand, having disdain upon those who are different than you. Beware, Christian, that you don't fall into the same sins that the people of Israel did in Malachi's day. Why? All this is a result of not fearing God. All of these sins are ultimately a result, a result of people who have no fear of God of people who don't take God at his word, of people who don't submit to the word of the Lord. And that's exactly what it says at the end of verse 5. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord will stand in judgment over and against such unrepentant sinners. The Lord will stand in judgment over and against such unrepentant sinners. What we have seen is three promises that the Lord will accomplish in order to display his justice. He will come. He will purify his people. And he will judge his enemies. How can you and I have confidence in this reality? How can you and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is who he says he is And he will remain the same forever and ever. Look with me in verse 6. I think those are the same questions that Israel may have had. And the Lord says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God is faithful to the very end, brother, sister, and friend. God is faithful to his people. All of this, the entirety of this passage, is done through the Messiah, who is both God and man, The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the only one who has both the authority and the ability to carry these things out. Are you right with the God of justice, my friend? Have you been forgiven of your sin? Do you have the utmost confidence that if the Lord were to suddenly appear, you would be welcomed with loving arms? Or do you doubt? Is there sin that maybe this passage has hit on in your life that's been going on unchecked, unmarked? Well, I encourage you, my friend, test yourself and see if you are really 
of the faith. Make no mistake about it. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, but do not deceive yourself. Don't be an easy, easy believism people as Israel of old was. We're, we're children of Abraham. Uh, God's all right with us. Let's look at these people. They're the bad ones. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm a conservative person, and, and I'm against abortion, and I'm against all these things that God says he's against, so I'm all right. Overlapping some of the things that God has said does not give you a right standing with him. There is one way, one way in which you can have security in the God of justice. And that is that you have placed the entirety of your trust and your hope and your faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, this is what we stand upon. This is what we are about. And this is the message that we proclaim. Why? Because we know the God of justice will come again. And to our neighbors, and to our baristas, and to our friends, and to our family, and to all of those who are not in Christ Jesus, God is against them if they are unrepentant in their sin. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, church, for his glory and for the well-being of those who do not yet know him. Father, we pray that you would help us do just that. We pray that you would help us to be a people who understand who you are. What a glorious text we have before us. What glorious promises you have made. Would we never, ever, ever be okay being in Christ and just be comfortable for the rest of our lives until you return? But would we have a heart that is broken for those who don't know you? God, would we be like the Apostle Paul? We desire to give up our own salvation, even though that we can't that others might be saved. Do this in us, God. Do this in this church, God. That we would fast and we would pray and we'd be broken before you when we hear about uh, brothers and sisters who seem to be brothers but have walked away from the faith. Would you grant them repentance? And would we be empty vessels, God? Not concerned about what others think about us. concerned that you will come suddenly and that at your coming it's too late for many. Lord, give us an urgency to the gospel and our hearts overwhelm us and our words help us that we would live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May these truths sink deep into the fiber of our soul, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.